it's a warning for us. As we serve the Lord, as you walk with God, the book of Judges, as the name implies, deals with judgment. And there was 13 judges that are mentioned in the book of Judges. And what would happen is God would raise up a judge when the children of Israel or a portion of the children of Israel, I think is a more accurate way to describe it, um, would walk away from God and step into idolatry. And then God would send a judge, which was essentially, sometimes it was a, a warrior to fight, but many times it was someone that, yes, would fight for them, but would also share the word of God with them to bring them back into the way, as the Bible so often says. So Judges, we're about to read the the theme verse of Judges. But the warning is given here to those that walk away from the Lord, what happens? What happens to our mentality, to your mentality, as you slowly begin to step away from God? This is what can take place. And here's the crazy thing with all of this, is that in our pride, we are blinded in most part to this. So what you could see in somebody as they walk away from God, you won't see it in yourself. So you just have to have the faith to believe the Bible, that what the Bible says is true and it can happen to you. And so when we're here in Judges, this is the theme verse of Judges, and it's mentioned twice. We'll look at both of them. And I give this to us as a warning to warn you so you don't walk away from God. And what to look for if you notice yourself walking away from God. And here's the the deception is it happens so slowly. It happens one step at a time. That's where the devil gets you. That's where the devil gets you. Is it happens one step at a time. And we we have to take heed to that. But here's what eventually happens. We're in Judges chapter 17. We're just, I'm not going to get into all the context of this. There's more that I want to discuss. Judges chapter 17, verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. So they have no physical leader in front of them that they can look to. Okay, they don't have a king. Let me ask you, why didn't they have a king? Because God was their king. God was their king. Israel was in a what's called a theocracy. Okay, with God as the king and their his subjects. That's what a New Testament church is, by the way. It's no different. It's no different. A New Testament church is a theocracy with Jesus Christ as our king. But they had no physical king that they could go to, that they could look to. They were to look to God. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel, but, here it is, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And this is what happens with our thinking is we we start slowly stepping away from God and then we start justifying our decisions. We start justifying the, the choices we're making and we make it right in our own eyes and we ignore what God says. We don't care what God says. I have seen this happen way too many times with way too many people. This is exactly what happens. People that claim to be Christian come up with excuses why they don't need to be in church. Why they don't need to be in church. Well, why I can do this. One of the craziest things to me is I never even thought this would even be a thing one day, but hey, you know, when there's no king, every, everyone does that which is right in their own eyes. Okay, and you've got Christians arguing for tattoos. That, that one just blows me away. That just kind of came to my mind, arguing that saying that tattoos are okay. Right? Let me just be very clear. Tattoos are not okay. There's nothing good about them. There's nothing godly about them. They're completely of the world. 
they're from the world. There's nothing good about a tattoo. Nothing that you can associate any type of good with it. Now, what people want to do is they'll say, oh, well, I got a Bible verse or something tattooed on me to make it okay. But there's nothing good. You cannot justify it biblically getting a tattoo. Okay? This is coming from somebody that has two tattoos. Okay? So I'm not just up here saying, oh, oh, tattoos are bad. You shouldn't get one. I have them and they're wrong. I shouldn't have gotten them. I was a fool to have gotten them. But you've got people... So-called preachers arguing, saying they're okay. Like, well, who does that make you look like? Who does that associate you with? When you see someone with sleeve tattoos, do you think that's a godly person right there? You absolutely don't. You absolutely do not. God's people get so confused on what is godly and what's righteous, or they don't care. Or they don't care, or they just are a fake and a hypocrite, and they're not God's people. That's an option as well. But I'm talking about someone that's saved. It says, hey, they're going to do that which is right in their own eyes. You'll justify your sin. Every sin, every step you take, you will justify it. Every one of them. That's what happens as people walk away from God. Turn to Judges 21, 25. The theme verse of the book of Judges. Remember earlier I mentioned there was 13 judges, right? I've taught this many times, but what does the number 13 represent? Biblically. Rebellion. Rebellion. 13 represents rebellion. Okay, that's the number 13. You study it out in the Bible, the number 13 represents rebellion, okay? Jesus speaking to the 12, 11 apostles, he says, Have not I chosen 12 of you and one of you is a devil? Or he was speaking to all of them, I believe. I'd have to go back and look at the context, but that's a statement he makes. Have not I chosen 12 of you and one of you is a devil? Well, how many were there within that close group? Think about it. What's the number? How many were there? That's right, 13 if you count Jesus. And one of them was a devil. Okay? This, how many original states were there when we rebelled against Britain? How many? 13. Those are just off the top of my head. There's more stuff you could look in the book of Judges, even other places throughout the Bible that deal with the number 13. By the way, I mentioned there was 13 judges. Who was the most rebellious judge there was to what God wanted in the book of Judges? Anybody know? Samson, and he was number 13. He was number 13. Okay, 13 judges, 13 is the number of rebellion. Look at this, the, the last verse. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You'll justify it. You say, I know the Bible says, but, I know the Bible says, but, or I don't even want to talk about what the Bible says. I don't want to discuss it. I'm going to try and, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, la, 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 la. You know, I'm just going to kind of just go through life and kind of pretend to be ignorant, act ignorant, so I can hopefully, you know, just skate through and, and just get a slap on the wrist by God. That's people's thinking. But. I've seen as, as people have, have made mistakes. And by the way, we all do. We all do wrong. We've all messed up. Okay. But I'm not trying to justify it either. Just because we all do wrong doesn't make any of it right. Okay. It doesn't make any of it right. Just because David, you know, uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband doesn't make it right for any of us to do that. It's not justifying it because God forgave him. It doesn't justify adultery and murder because God forgave him. Just because God forgives us doesn't justify sin. So it's not like God's okay with it. He still doesn't want us to sin. I've watched people though, somebody does something wrong and they say, that's so wrong that they did that. How could they have done that? I don't understand it. And it, and it 
lights a passion within them, a fire within them. They're upset about it. They're saddened by it. They're, they're hurt by it. Whatever emotions it, it, it brings forth. And yet then go on to see that person that was so upset by that go and do something very similar, the same, and justify it. And then justify when they did it. See, everyone's wrong to do something until it's you. That's how most people end up being. Why? Because every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Everyone's wrong to do something until it's you doing it. And then you're like, wait, but you don't know why I'm doing it. You don't know why me. You don't understand why. Well, that person could say the same thing. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know why I'm doing this. You don't know why. You don't understand. You don't know what I faced in my life. And you know, in the end, when we stand before God and we have to give an account of ourselves, it's going to be nothing but excuses. It'll be nothing but excuses. Honestly, I personally don't even believe God's going to give us a chance to make our excuses. I think his, his word is going to stop our mouths. His law is going to stop our mouths. We're not even going to get to make our excuses. We can make them here. We can make our excuses here. For why we lose our temper, why we go and, and, and do such and such, why we, why we tell a lie, why whatever it is, why we deceive people, why we steal, who knows, whatever it is. We're not going to get away with it. Even though right now you can do that which is right in your own eyes. Everything You can justify everything. Go with me a couple more spots. Let's go to Proverbs if we would please. The book of Proverbs chapter 12. You want a good study? You say, I don't know what to study in the Bible. You want a good study? Go through the book of Proverbs and look up what a fool is. What a fool is. The sad thing is you'll probably find yourself there quite a bit. You'll be like, man, that's describing me. That's the tough part about it. You're like, man, there I am again. You're like, man, just left and right. I keep getting called a fool here. But it'll teach you. It'll help you. It's a good study to go through. But in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, it says, The way of a fool. The way. What does the way mean? The way of a fool. What does that imply, the way? The path, the steps, the decisions, the places, the people that this person associates with. The thought process, whatever, all of it, the way, the, the, this is the, the, the path that my life is taking. Okay, if I'm that fool, but look, here's what it says. The way of a fool is what? Is right in his own eyes. Everything that people do is they feel is right. Just about. I mean, I get I know there's some things that people like, yeah, I did that and I know it was stupid. But for the most part, the decisions people make in life, they feel like they're making the right decisions. Right? I know we all say, yeah, I shouldn't have done that one thing, but for the most part, the decisions I've made in my life have been pretty good. Okay? Yes, you can find an exception to what I just said. You can go find that person that's like, no, every decision I made has been bad. Okay, you get a safe person walking with God, they're going to say, no, I've, I've done a lot of bad things. I've done a whole lot of dumb decisions. When I'm going my way, it's complete foolishness. All right. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you just go find your average Joe and they're going to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm doing pretty good. Okay, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Now, when you look at Psalms and Proverbs, they're written in a in a poetic form called uh, Hebrew parallelism. Parallelism. Okay, what parallelism is, it, it's either going to compare two things or contrast two things. Okay, so it's going to build upon what it's teaching 
or it's going to say there's this one thing and then there's this bad thing and there's this good thing or there's this good thing and there's this bad thing. It's kind of like the opposite is what it's going to do or it's going to build upon it. It's going to say here, doing this is good and, and this added with it is better or is, is more. That's kind of how it works. So when we look at this in verse 15, it says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Okay, so the one thing it's teaching, hey, a fool's going to do whatever he wants and he's going to think that it's right. But now look at the contrast here. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So what does that tell you about a fool? What's that? That's right. A fool won't listen to counsel. So if you're sitting in here and, and you're, you're making decisions about your life and you're not even willing to ask people, like I'm talking about people that you should go ask, like a pastor, okay, parents, someone with more experience than you in whatever that thing is. If you're not even willing to ask, then guess what you are? You're a fool. That's what the Bible says. If you're not willing to get advice from people who know more than you, who've been there, who've done it, who've learned more, who have better understanding, you're a fool. Okay? So the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. I don't need to ask their advice because I know what I'm doing. Right? I know what I'm doing. But here's what how God contrasts that. But... Hey, a fool says, hey, I'm not asking anyone. I know what I'm doing. That's what a fool says. God says, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So to hearken to counsel, you first have to seek counsel. And God says, when you listen to counsel, you're wise. There's wisdom in that. Okay, even if you say, well, you know, I asked five people and, and you know, two of them said to do something opposite than the other three. So what should I do? Well, you've got some counsel. You have a decision to make. But you're not a fool because you could say, well, let's see what they said. Let's see what they said. What does God say? And maybe let me go ask somebody else. But you've sought out counsel that are hopefully it's godly counsel that's going to point you in the right direction. And sometimes both answers can be correct. It's just, is it correct in this situation for me? There's a whole lot that goes into it. But my point is that a wise person is going to ask other people, what do you think about this decision? A fool will say, I'm not asking anybody. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to ask anybody. I don't answer to anybody. I'm my own person. That type of attitude. Or just, you know, because you're so proud, but you, you don't you don't have to put off the air that you're proud, but you're like, I'm going to just, I know what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to ask anybody. It goes on further to say, verse 16, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. A fool's wrath is presently known. What do you think that means? What's that? Someone that's an angry person? How is a fool's wrath presently known? They're loud? What's that? Yeah. They let everybody know, right? They blow their top. And everybody knows about it. A uh, fool's wrath is presently known. Okay, that, that's it. Man, it's like, was God describing some of us here? I know that's described me more times than I care to count. Okay, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. You start looking at what these things say, and there it is. A fool's wrath is presently known. But look at this, but a prudent man. Now, a, prudence, a prudent person is someone that's looking, you know, farther down the road. I'm looking for danger. Okay, prudence is, is to, to look farther down the road and, and plan for it, basically. That's what prudence is. Okay, it says, but a prudent man covereth shame. So a prudent man foresees, hey, maybe this could go bad and I could get upset with that. So let me just be careful here. Let me not have something that I'm going to be ashamed of later. Because you ever just said something and then regretted it like instantly? You're like, well, you can't get that back, can you? And now you're like, I'm ashamed that I said that. I really hurt that person's feelings or whatever it was. Foolish me. Now I can't get it back. A prudent person says, look, you know what? Let me avoid this situation because I might say something I'm going to regret. And I don't want to do that. They're covering shame. Now I'm not going to have something to be ashamed about because I'm just going to, I see that could happen. Let me kind of just go this way. Let me avoid it. All right. So 
we're just looking here. But again, going back to this, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. In his own eyes. That's the deception. That's the deception. That's our pride. Will kill us every time. Now one more spot. We're going to look at Proverbs 21, 12. And again, I'm saying all this to warn us. To warn us. Everyone here is susceptible to this stuff. The Bible says there's no new thing under the sun. Okay. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We still live by that today. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2. It says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. I wonder if God's trying to get that point across to us. By having it, we've looked at it, these four instances in the Bible where it's mentioned. There's other ways it's said throughout the Bible. But, but look at this, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. You think God's trying to teach us something. So if, if the way of a man, or put, put yourself there, if your way is right in your own eyes, then what are you to do about that? Then that means you can justify anything. Okay, if that's true, and if your attitude is, well, that's how I think, I know I'm right in this situation, then why was Hitler wrong? Why was Hitler wrong? If we all get to be right in our own eyes, if you're justified in, in your decisions and what you're doing and everything you do is right, then why wasn't everything Hitler did right? Or Ted Bundy? Or Charles Manson? You know, some mass murderer. Why isn't what they do right? How do we know? We have to have a final arbiter an ultimate standard that's going to dictate that. And that's what this verse teaches us here. It says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. It goes back to the Lord. The Lord's the one that tells us. That's how we know if it's right. And I'm afraid that we don't even want to look at what God says in so many instances. We don't want to judge if what we're doing, the way we're living is right according to God. And it just doesn't matter. I'm going to live my way. This is what makes me comfortable. This is what makes me happy. And I'm not going to answer to anybody. Remember, judges, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Are we living that way right now? Because we're in a theocracy. If you're a member of this church, you are in a theocracy, and you voluntarily stepped into it. There's not one person here was forced into this theocracy. You voluntarily stepped into God's kingdom. You chose it willingly. So are you in this kingdom and yet doing that which is right in your own eyes? Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. God's weighing our hearts. God's checking. God, He's the one we're going to have to stand before and give an account of ourselves to. We will have to answer to God. You will have to answer to God. And here's the difficult thing for, for us, for mankind, for humans, is that I don't have to answer for it right now. Now, yes, there can be consequences to our sin. I, I understand that. But as far as like What's going to happen when I die and I stand before God and I have to give an account for my sin? That, I don't have to answer for it right now. So it's almost like we feel like there's no consequence. And I'm getting away with this. And, you know, I can kind of live how I want. And I can look at these other Christians and, and they live that way. So, so can I. And they're still good people. So why can't I do it that way? Whose standard are you going by? See, we're afraid to ask ourselves, what does God say? What does God say? What does God expect? And not for me to judge and pick at them, but for me to look at myself and say, what does God expect? What does God expect of me? So the warning is that we can deceive ourselves. You can justify anything that you do, any decision you make. 
you can justify it. And you probably already have. I know there's times I have. But it's just dangerous for you. It will lead you down a path that you'll do things you never thought you would. Maybe you get tired of hearing me say that, but it's 100% true. You will go down a path that you'll do things you never thought you would. Because every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Because you justified it. So I just wanted to give us a warning. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. Please just help us to take heed and, and to learn from this, Lord, and not be fools. God, it's so easy for us to be foolish. I know I have more times than I care to count, God. We just ask your forgiveness, please, and that you would help us, Lord, to walk humbly before you. Please, Lord, break us of our pride, our selfishness. Please, Lord, just help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.